first of all, first of all, we don't start with this session before you have done your work because you have to vote. You have got a small machine somewhere. There should be also somewhere somebody who talks about the technique. And you have to vote because there are some questions. And uh, there. Well, no, I can read it. So maybe you found it already because I'm not the technician myself. So I don't know how to do it. The questions are there. I'll just read them again. And then we'll really start huh? because we haven't got that much time. And the safety first topic is very, really a very important one. So. We want to know just now, and we want to know after this discussion or this panel, uh, will guests in future accept significantly stronger safety and security measures and pay for more safety? This is the thing which are, we are very interested in, what you are thinking about that. Will they pay? Will they feel good if they see and feel more security and safety in their hotels or in tourism. So the answers, the possible answers, yes, they will accept stronger safety and security measures. Yes, that's number two. Yes, they will accept stronger safety and security measures and pay for it. No, they will not accept stronger safety and security measures. We'll talk about them. And no, they will not accept anything. They don't <laughs> accept stronger safety and security measures and will not pay for it. So now uh, there should be some clock over there, some seconds you have got. And so, ah, here it is, the music. So please vote just now. What's your opinion about this question? <laughs> Interesting. Equal. Is there any clock? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's like in the television a little bit, huh? <laughs> wow, mm -hmm. who's winning? To tie. Okay. Well, it's very clear. Okay, they will pay. That's the main <laughs> thing, huh? <laughs> it's your topic, <laughs> <Now we're talking. laughs> because we had some discussions about that. Will they pay or not? Who has to pay? So we'll talk about that as well. So done. Ten seconds. Okay, let's go. Thank you. She's my chef today. Okay, great. Safety first. In June 2015, there have been those terrorist attacks in Tunisia. At that time, we ran three hotels uh, on Jaraba, and it was a Friday morning, and our expats, our GMs, they have been back to Paris on Sunday morning. It was the first time that a terrorist attack attacked my small little tourism world. I was afraid for my people, for my staff. And we never went back. November 2015, Paris, 130 dead. Very near, very close to my little world. Paris, it's just here. I've been in Paris, I don't know how many times. We are planning a hotel in Paris with 25 hours, We're really nearly ready to go. New Year's Eve 2016, I think the sixth terrorist attack in Istanbul. So, crazy. In Istanbul, we also want, want to make some hotels. We already signed contracts. It was, again, my little world, my personal little world. I have been attacked. It was the feeling I had got. Before, I didn't have that feeling. It was very far away. So, and in December 2016, 50 meters from my hotel, uh, 25 hours here, the bikini, there was a Berlin attack. Let's call it like that. So, attacks and crisis penetrated my own world. And that was the moment when I decided to think about safety and security 
in the hotel and the tourism business because I'm living from hotel and tourism. And I don't want to have those attacks anymore. And no, let's, nobody wants to have them. Uh, but uh, I want to do my part or my share to do something against it. So I found it with a partner of mine who's here as well. Uh, I founded also a security company just to, to teach the hotel business, the independence, how to do something against terrorist attacks and what to, is to do if there's a crisis. Okay, so may I introduce you to you, the panelists. They are four specialists. I'm not a specialist, not yet. Uh, I'll be in 20 years maybe, because you are working lots of time in this uh, business and I'm working since some months in this business. So I, don't, I know that I don't know that much, but uh, you know enough for all of us. And uh, so the first one is Georges-Pierre Cladogeny. I had to ask him how it, uh, when, uh, <laughs> it worked, it worked. <laughs> okay, he's the Global Product Manager of Safety and Security for Council of Aglui Travel. So he's a one of the big tourist player and a tourism player. And he is a product manager for exactly that, what we are talking about today. There's Sébastien Mayer. It was easier, Mayer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. He's something which I didn't know that it exists in this world, Chief Resilience Man uh, yeah, officer. Officer, officer, that's it, of the city <laughs> of Paris. So he really knows about what's about terrorists and other attacks, but he is not the safety and security officer, you are the resilience officer, so I'm very interested to hear what you are doing, because again, I didn't know what you have done, uh, what a resilience manager does. Then one of those uh, who do it in the international, in the, this world of tourism, that's you, Paul, Paul Moxness, he is the vice president, especially for corporate safety and security, uh, uh, with Carlson Residor Hotel Group, so you're working worldwide. And uh, this theme, I think uh, your company is also in countries which are not very stable, so um, I, we are very interested to hear about that. And uh, last but not least, Gerhard Struger. He is the regional vice president for uh, the Swiss hotel brand. He's working, and that's the main thing. He's living in 2000, since 2005 in Istanbul. And Istanbul has changed a lot. He will tell us about that, because Istanbul has been one of the most lively cities I ever have seen on, on this world. And today, it's not totally different, but it is different. It is different, times have changed. So you're the first one. The first question is for you, Gerhard. Uh, you are the regional vice president. You are living there since 2005. When those terrorist attacks and all the other things, there have been demonstrations, there has been the putsch in, uh, in Turkey. So did you feel as a hotelier that you are trained enough, that your staff is trained enough, that uh, you could help the people? Has the hotel world, uh, has, has that been a shelter for those who had to have a shelter in this moment? Yeah, well, let me go back a little bit because this is my second time in Istanbul since 2005. I was first time there between 97 and 2000. And in 1999, as some of you may know, we had an, an, a disastrous earthquake. And actually in 1999, uh, we started looking at that because naturally the hotel, which is Japanese built, became a shelter for, for, for people. People just came and wanted to have a room. Once we were fully booked, they wanted to sleep by the pool. Once the pool was full, they wanted to sleep in the lobby. And you just open your doors. But at that time, we were not prepared that much, I have to admit this. Mind you, we always had considerable security departments for terrorist attacks, because uh, the, the PKK was active in Turkey already since many, many years. But at that time, we started building up security and safety and, and, and protection plans. And I left and I came back in 2005 and we continued this plan. And um, so we were prepared to a certain extent, I would say, because we, we also, you did not mention it, but we had these terrible attacks in India. And that was for me, and we had one in, in Jakarta, and that was for me a little bit the wake-up call where I said, okay, we are also, we are giving 
shelter not only 2,000 employees and maybe 1,200 guests, but also to the neighborhood. And, and, and the hotel in itself is, is sitting on a big plot of land. So we started building up and training our people for catastrophes in a wider sense. So that specific hotel, I think, was prepared well. Many hotels in Turkey are prepared well because they live with terrorism and, and natural catastrophes since, since a long time. Around the world, in all the parts of my responsibility, no, because it didn't become an, an issue. I opened the hotel, the Swiss hotel in Istanbul here, uh, in, in Berlin here, and which is again 50 meters away from the from the Gedächtniskirche, and we were not prepared. But I think, coming back to your initial question, I think we're getting in that dire direction. Okay, Sebastian, you are this uh, <coughs> chief resident resilience officer of the city of Paris. What are you doing the whole day? Hey, <laughs> that's a really relevant question. Mm, thank um, you. I could say that uh, I'm also the silos cross-cutting officer, uh, which is a really new position in the public organizations. Um, in the network I belong to, which is the 100 Resilient Cities Network, pioneered by the Rockefeller Foundation, maybe I tell you a few words about it later. Uh, we call this position the unicorn position. So the unicorn is this magic animal that doesn't exist, but has really strong powers. Um, the idea is to prepare the city, the global city, including its private sector, its population, its NGOs, not only the municipality, but the city as a territory, to prepare the city to be able to face any kind of shocks or chronic stresses. Um, uh, let me explain this. A shock could be, in our vocabulary, a terrorist attack, a heat wave, a flood, a pandemic. Uh, and the chronic stress um, more relates to air pollution, global warming effects, um, social cohesion, lack, uh, etc. And uh, I'm supposed to adapt, to propose a strategy, like we do in a hundred cities all over the world, uh, in order to link this risk together in a holistic and integrated approach. I hope this is not too technical. But the idea is fighting against a risk alone is not enough. And the interdependencies and between the different kind of risk or stresses our cities um, have to face, uh, it's really important to, uh, uh, to have this global uh, vision. So, of course, I had to deal with um, resilience against terrorist attacks. And I'll tell you a few words about that. Okay. So, thank you, Paul. Uh, you are doing another job, you are working for an international company and you are a vice president especially for safety and security. What does that mean? What are you doing? This, uh, what, are, what is your function? Okay, I can, I can maybe start by saying what I don't do and, and what's not my responsibility, at least my perceived responsibility. Uh, and that is that it, I don't feel it's my responsibility to protect all of our hotels because we can't do that from a central location. We have about 1,400 hotels around the world, 80 different countries. We have hotels with thousands of rooms and hotels with, I think our smallest one has like about 30 rooms. So you can't sit, you can't write a one-size-fits-all manual, you can't tell them how to do everything in a specific way in all these different jurisdictions with all these different organizations and things. So my role is not to protect uh, the hotels. My role is to uh, help the hotels take care of themselves. Um, and that's why we also have a, a motto that, that we say that the motto for corporate safety and security in, in Carlson Residor is always care. So it's caring about people, caring about property, caring about the world around us. And then our role is to facilitate for the hotels uh, so that they have access to training programs, access to best practice, access to information about threats, risks that are uh, trending in, in their part of the world or globally, whatever it might be. Make sure they, they get that information out along with support from either us or others that have been through that kind okay. of uh, situation before and can help them prepare for it. Great. 
Thank you. George Pierre, uh, your title is Global Product Manager Safety and Security at Carlson Vago Lead Travel. So that sounds a little bit as if you sell a product which is called safety and security. Do you really sell that or is it um, only the name, the product manager? Well, the role of product manager goes from uh, everything that we provide our customers as well as uh, introducing them to partners that sell solution. I think what is important to say is that as uh, Sebastian Paul and Gerard said, uh, there has been a wide range of uh, uh, reactions to the next few months and next few years uh, that have passed during which most of our corporate clients have uh, awakened to the fact that safety and security is a subject, <coughs> that there is a need to do more, and that uh, more importantly, their travelers, which are their employees, which is, as most companies today say, is uh, their primary assets, need to be taken care of when they, they travel. Uh, business travel as a, as a practice has evolved drastically among the past 20 years, and safety and security is the last aspect that is coming today. It's coming today because of um, you know what is going on, but it's also part of something bigger, something that corporation gives their, their employees. The first layer of uh, this movement came through the corporate social responsibility practice that uh, took stage probably during the past 10 years uh, to the point where now corporate travelers expect their company to provide them safety and security, expect them to take care of them when they travel for them. Well, next question again for you. So uh, you told us that uh, in the past, in the near past, companies uh, who booked their travel or made their travel with your company, the, the whole topic of security and safety was only a cost component. It was annoying, it was nobody wanted to have it, and it changed the last two years. So what changed? Did it, are they afraid now of attacks, of crisis, or what's really behind that so change? I think it's, it all comes down to even the way we reacted to what happened during the past two years. I think there, is a, there has been a realization at the individual level, and that realization at the individual level obviously expressed through fear. From a company and corporate perspective, that fear translated into something that we need to do, something now, where, as you were correctly stating before, all of these discussions were around cost component and do we really need to spend money on this? Is this something we need? Where, where today, you know, I think the discussion is more on how we move forward, how we make sure that this is integrated into our business practice, and this is what our customers are telling us. So that's the reason why you know, we're moving towards implementing more solutions and working together with you know, different channels to make sure that our customers' so travel really is protected. Yeah. Mm -hmm, I did. Gerhard, uh, topic cost component. Uh, what do you think who, who uh, who has to pay for all that new safety and security stuff. If there are any investments, and there are huge investments, I didn't know before, but you can spend money on that. Uh, in the investment, if you build a new hotel, you should have to think about that. And there are also investments or running costs. Uh, so the owner, the manager, the lessee, the guests, who has to pay? Well, I think it's a... You have to see what type of contract you're in. I mean, it's a management contract. Typically, as a management company, the management company doesn't own any shares in the property, in the asset. So it's the asset owner who has to pay. Uh, if it's a lease, it's typically the, the, the one who holds the lease. Uh, as, a, as an owner, well, it's very clear. You own the stuff. But I think there are various components. One is, of course, the soft component, where, where for example, you come in where a management company comes in with know-how, with, 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 with training, with development, with, with, with during the construction phase already advisory, um, which should be contributed through the management company typically. Uh, when it comes to the, to the running cost, well, the running cost is very clearly defined actually who has to pay for them. And, and, and in, in international hotel business, in, if, you, if you work with an international company, it's actually quite clearly defined 
uh, who has to pay for what. So, personally, I think there is a benefit to it in the end. Because as we have seen, people are prepared to pay more and p people will be prepared to pay more. And I think this is quite natural. We see this in our daily life. I mean, we operate three hotels right now in Istanbul. We operate another four hotels in Turkey right now amongst, I'm talking b b before merger with Accor, acquisition through Accor. I mean, we, we, amongst the three brands, Fairmont, Raffles and Swiss Hotel. And all the newer hotels are already built with security and safety in mind. A hotel like the Swiss Hotel, 25 years old, was not built to that extent with safety security in mind. It's Japanese built, the construction mm -hmm. is safe, earthquake proof. But when, it to when we talk about security, that was not so much of an issue. But nowadays, we already step in, and I'm sure you will confirm this to me, Paul, during the construction of, of, of a hotel, where we say this should be there in order to, to, to protect our guests and protect ultimately property. Okay. Okay, still talking about money. Uh, Paris lost guests after the last attack, maybe after both attacks, I don't know. Uh, so, and they lost money. Berlin didn't lose that much, much money. The, the occupancy was before it was high and it was uh, high after the attack. Uh, what do you think, why, and how high was the decrease of occupancy or of guests in Paris, because it was quite astonishing for us in, in Germany to, to read the paper and there was something about 30% catastrophe, tourism is going down, and we were really astonished. So what is the real story behind that? At first, <clears throat> I'd say that there is a big difference between both uh, attacks, between the, the attack in Berlin and the attack in Paris especially because in Paris it was a multiple attacks, uh, really planned, organized before, coming from abroad, and it's much more scary than a crazy guy doing something just one. Uh, so psychologically speaking, for the people, it's not the same way to, to, to recover from this. Um, and I think this is one of, of the reasons. The other one is probably the mediatic treatment um, international mediatic treatment of um, these events. And it's really important the way uh, the media talk about the events and about the, the way the population react. And um, so this is one of the goals we identified in our feedback experience um, after this event. Of course, the, the economic consequences were huge uh, in Paris. Uh, we had, uh, right after November attacks, 30% uh, cancellations of flights, hotel nights, uh, in the next weeks. So 30% is huge. Uh, and um, in the whole uh, uh, 2016 year, uh, we lost, uh, we had 6% decline in attendance in the hotel sector compared to uh, the year before. But this had been compensated by the Euro football competition uh, that was in July. So that was a huge event. People came anyway. Uh, but in a, without this event, the decline would have been worse. Um, international flights or arrivals in Paris decreased by 8.4% uh, compared to the year before and 10% uh, compared to the year uh, to 2014. So we're talking about billions, um, about billions. But it's getting better. It's already getting better. Um, Paris is still the first uh, touristy destination. Um, and we were mostly saved by the business tourism, conferencing tourism, mm. uh, and national tourism. Uh, that really compensated um, the lack of international tourism, especially coming from Asia. Uh, most of the cons cancellations uh, were coming uh, from Asia. And about the costs uh, that you were just talking about, we really have common interest, uh, the private and the public sector, um, because uh, this is a lack of uh, money for the city, but at first this is a lack of money for the tourism industry. And if we can't recover together from such events, 
uh, you're going to lose your businesses and we're going to lose our taxes. Um, so uh, we really, my advo I always advocate uh, to have a common vision and approach uh, between the private and the public sector about this urban resilience. Uh, it's absolutely necessary, uh, necessary uh, in order to um, globally recover. I can detail if you want, but I don't want to take mm. too much time. That's quite an interesting thing because uh, it will be the tourism branch or the industry lives from the last 5%. We always say it's not correct, but the last 5% have been gone. No? So they lose money in Paris just now. Sure. That's and it. They the really lose. Tourism industry in Paris is 13% of the employment. Wow. It's huge. Okay. It's totally huge. So, of course, you, you are responsible of the safety and security in your hotel and in your establishment. But you have a rule in the safety and the security of the city. And so, I'll detail later, but I'm sure I want to propose, for instance, in Paris to the tourism industry, uh, agreement processes to work together in order to be prepared and to recover as fast as possible because time is money uh, in, in these situations. Okay. Paul, uh, you sent us in advance to this panel a uh, small paper, which was very interesting. It was called Communicate, Collaborate and Contribute. I thought it very interesting and there was one, one uh, thing, uh, one expression you used which I wanted you to figured it out a little bit, that means that was the remove the taboo. One way or we should remove the taboo. What do you mean with that? Yeah, so what I meant was um, that when I started, and, and I'm getting to be an old guy, and I started out as a night security guard in a hotel in 1987. Um, the hotel didn't want to hire me, but the other guy that applied for the job withdrew his application, so they were stuck with me. And 30 years later, I'm in the same company, so I've seen the whole evolution from, from uh, back there. Uh, and to be honest, my job in the, at the start as a night security guard was to make sure nothing bad happened, or at least officially nothing bad should happen in the hotel. So at night, if there was anything going on, it was our job to respond to it, fix it, clean it up, uh, make sure that when the guests awoke the next morning and the boss came to work, nothing bad had happened, <laughs> right? And, but today we live in a world where, and, and we didn't talk about security in those days. Everything we did was secret. Um, we didn't share information. We didn't try to prevent stuff. We, we were a response team. Um, if you fast forward to today, uh, you can't operate like that. Number one, we can't have incidents going on all the time because number one, they'll be live tweeted <laughs> or streamed direct. Um, and so you can't fix it before uh, the, the boss comes to work or before the guests wake up or anything like that. It's, it's already out there. And so the focus has to shift way more to prevention. And you can't prevent stuff by, uh, if you don't talk about them. You have, to, you have to be really open about the fact that bad things can happen. And the more you think about it, the more you plan for it, the more you thought through what you're going to do when it happens, the better chance you have to recovering from it. So I think in, in our industry, we still have a bit of a taboo around safety and security where, oh, it's, it's something we have to have, but that's not what we really do. Mm -hmm. Whereas I, th I think so we need to integrate it much more into the business, so it shouldn't even be necessarily a separate thing. Every, every job, every, every person in a hotel has a safety and security aspect around how to work safely, how to, you know, if it's, it's so integrated into what we do but we talk about it as if it's something else, and, and we have to get rid of that. On the carpet. And the more we'll talk about it, and coming to the events like this, putting it out there, speaking with each other about it, Correct. the more chance we have to find good solutions that can be integrated into the business. So 
Okay. And that's, that's where Well, there's from. a next question as well for you. So uh, the hotel industry made some steps as far as I got to know from you. The hotel industry made some steps in direction, more security for the guests. And there has been, uh, or there is now, a hotel security working group within the OSAC. Okay, what's that? Okay, so th if, if we compare ourselves to airlines, for example, the airlines have had industry-led standards for safe and secure flight operations for basically since the, I think, since the early 60s, they've, they've come together and had, uh, you know, uh, standards that everyone kind of signs up to and agrees on as an industry. In hotels, we don't have that. It's every brand for themselves or every country for themselves, or in, even every city for themselves. And so, um, and I think it was about 2004, 2005, um, uh, the International Hotel, Associ Hotel and Restaurant Association put together some advocacy councils. And one of those was for safety and security. And that was the first time people from the hotel groups came together to talk about this. Almost as soon as we got started, the IHRA uh, disbanded all their advocacy councils. And so, uh, and we had seen huge opportunity to, to work together on this. And so OSAC came in, and OSAC is facilitated by the U.S. State Department. It stands for Overseas Security Advisory Council. And basically, it's, it's sharing information uh, that can help uh, businesses uh, based in the U.S. operate safely abroad. Uh, from the hotel side, a lot of us in the hotel security working group, um, about half of us aren't U.S. based. Uh, we have Intercontinental, which is U.K. based, Accor in France, Carlson Residor, I'm based in Brussels, uh, Marriott, Disney, Hyatt, and we, uh, and Hilton, we work really closely with, with my counterparts in those companies Mm. companies to share information um, and, and best practice with, with each other because we don't have the, in, the industry agreed standard. We're working towards at least sharing our best practices with each other, what we're seeing out in the world that could be affecting uh, travel, and then we work together to see if we can make all of our destinations as safe as possible. because. It's, if, if an incident happens like in Paris, it's, it's impacting all of the brands. So it's not about us making the safest hotel, it's about working together to make travel safe okay. for everyone. To have a safe network for yeah. all, all the tourists, not only on the hotel. Sebastian, you mentioned those 100 resilient cities on this world which were founded or which are paid by, I don't know, so that exactly uh, by the Rockefeller Foundation. So this is also a thing I never heard before, very interesting. So Paris is part of it, and as far as I understood, you are paid by them. I am paid by the city of Paris, but the city of Paris is reimbursed uh, for my whole income, taxes included, for two years, and the Rockefeller Foundation pays that in 100 cities. Um, for, uh, let's say, um, program managers who uh, directly relate either to the mayor or to the head of the public administration. That's why the idea is to, um, is to have this cross-cutting position. The Rockefeller Foundation, which is one of the most uh, uh, powerful philanthropic uh, NGO, uh, decided uh, three years ago for its centennial anniversary to invest massively in urban resilience, uh, considering that this is the future of the world. This holistic approach, uh, because the future is uncertain, much more than last century. Last century, uh, we were sure that the future, w I, I grew up with the idea that the future would be better anyway. Mm. It totally changed. Mm. Now we know that because of global warming, terrorist context, economic crisis, crisis etc., the Optimism is not that much present. So resilience, urban resilience, can be a relevant framework uh, to build the future of our cities. Uh, and uh, they are really attractive because they found my income. Um, they provide me a um, consulting firm 
for free that helps me to build a strategy, and I can benefit from uh, studies, survey expertises uh, from a hundred private companies, NGOs, universities uh, during the program. Their idea is to invest both in the private sector uh, with this unicorn chief resilience officer in the middle of uh, the public sector, the public sector, and in the same time to build a private market for resilience uh, in order to answer to the needs of the public sector. So they really invest in both direction and their idea is to link it uh, to build the future of the cities. It's really ambitious. So maybe you can tell us something about this uh, example with Toyota, just yeah. so, uh, to understand what that means, uh, the connection between private and public sector. Yeah, we have often used this uh, example uh, in the 90s. Um, of, um, Toyota built in Turkey, uh, northwest uh, of Turkey, um, um, car factories that was perfectly resilient against earthquakes. Uh, the architects uh, were specialists on earthquake resilience, and it was built to resist uh, to any kind of earthquake. Uh, you mentioned it, uh, 99, one of maybe the biggest earthquake in Turkey, and it worked. The factory resisted perfectly, nothing moved, but it could never reopen, or something like five to ten years later, because the city where the employees were living was totally destroyed with uh, 17,000 deaths, and a factory uh, without employees is not a factory anymore. So this is the, the, the illustration of the need to think about these issues together. Uh, it's for the continuity of the businesses uh, of the private sector, but, and it's for the safety and the security of the people in the city. So once again, we have shared interest uh, in resilience. Okay. Georges Pierre, is that the thing you are thinking as well? Do you think that companies, or don't you think that companies like yours, which are really huge companies, and they can do lots of things for tourists, that they can do it as a standalone? Or do you think it has to have a network to ensure security for tourists, uh, a network between privates, between companies, between institutions, between cities, I don't know what. So, uh, so what's your opinion? I, I think as, uh, as Paul mentioned, Sebastian did as well, and Gerard too, um, the subject of security when you are traveling is something that is quite complex at such. Uh, however, there is a lot of things that can be done to minim mitigate that. The first, the first aspect is definitely prevention, and prevention comes with knowledge. Uh, traveling to a country when you're a business traveler can be at, at times very interesting, very um, even um, uh, something that you're looking forward to, but you need to be prepared for that. And you know, companies such as ours are helping their employers to make sure that when you travel, and when somebody travels in any case, there is the information that you need when you need it. It, it can go from, you know, most people will be uh, focusing on things that have very large impacts, where in fact um, the most common aspect of safety and security for a business traveler or for a tourist will be things that are from day to day life. Um, medical urgency is something we didn't talk about yet, but it is something that is critical because that's something that can happen and with a very high probability of happening, higher than having a terrorist attack. Uh, travel disruption is also something that, that can create a safety and security risk. So having uh, the collaboration of all of the actors, public and private, work toward providing the best information to the tourists, being a business traveler or a person, is definitely what will make the difference when you know, you're feeling safe or, or unsafe. Gat and I were discussing earlier, there is a lot of information that is available for uh, private companies to buy on the market in terms of um, getting information uh, mm -hmm. from different you know, locations, even making sure that you have a briefing on the, on the place where you're, you're going to travel to, if that place is typically something that is cold and safe. However, when you think about it from a tourist perspective, or even for yourself, when, when you say, you know, I, I will travel to, let's say, uh, some countries in, in Africa next year, where are you going to find that information? 
where that information is going to come and be available. So I think you know, having access to the right information, truly vetted, meaning something that is not uh, with a political agenda, which is quite uh, you know, difficult to find for an individual today, is the key aspect that needs to be worked on. Okay. So I, I think, however, I said this also, sorry if I may pitch in here. I think we have to be careful. Travel is still safe. And I think you have to apply common sense. I think this is the, this is really w what we all have to keep in our minds. I mean, it's not unsafe to travel, it can, but it can happen to you. I mean, there's a lot of Berliners here, I guess. Did any one of you think before he went to a Christmas market, he, she went to a Christmas market before? No, probably not. And probably you haven't changed your lifestyle. Of course, if you travel somewhere else, I mean, you, you look where you're going and where do you get this information. But in the end, I don't think it's more well, there is a higher risk around, but I mean, it can hit you everywhere. Okay. Next question, other side of the coin. Gerhard, what do you think whether hotelier or the hotel industry can do, especially in Turkey, to win back the tourists? What do you have to do? Because it can't be like that. There are lots of hotels which are nearly empty just now in all of Turkey. and. The hotel industry can't wait until 100 resilient cities are going to be not founded but uh, are going to work. So we have to do something, the industry has to do something, maybe together in the network, I don't know. So what do you think, what do we really have to do? Well, I think, um, the, the, I read somewhere that, that a terrorism attack or terrorism per se has a lifespan of 24 months, something like 18 to 24 months, and then it's forgotten. The problem is if it happens, it happens, it happens again. Hmm. But of course, the other side is, as I said before, I mean, it happens everywhere nowadays. I mean, will you stop traveling? No, I don't think so. I think there is a time when people will maybe retract a little bit. I mean, we've seen this in the tourism figures. People from Germany, from Austria, Central Europe, they stay in, in Central Europe because this is common ground, we know it, I mean, this is our home. Um, but the same happens also in Turkey. I mean, we have much more Turkish tourists now, tourists now uh, staying in Turkey. We have a lot from the region, like Middle East, I mean, people come. So eventually, I think this is going to go away. We have to promote, we have to eventually invest in, in security. And, and this, has, this has to be a concerted effect. Uh, um, it has to be the private sector who has to spend money in making the hotels more secure. It has to be the companies who, who train and develop people and, and who invest in security training. It has to be the cities. Um, so it's, it's a concerted effort, I think. And, and destinations come and destinations go. I, uh, for example, if it, since Turkey is always here and I represent in a way Turkey, um, the destination will always be great. There's many, many other aspects why people are not traveling to Turkey. But I think when we talk about security, I mean, if you go to Istanbul now, I do not change my life. I go out, I go to places, and, and those places where typically you're confronted with potential attackers, you, it's, it's, it's limited. It's not, of course, it's not neglectable. It can hit you. But I mean, it's like an airplane coming down. I mean, you, you sit in the plane, you're unlucky. But I mean, how many planes do come down? Mm. Maybe the next question for Paul uh, is fitting to that because I always was wondering when I went to Nigeria or somewhere, um, there I've been to Lagos, it was quite safe, the hotel, I thought so. <laughs> I think it wasn't, uh, if I look at it uh, today, but uh, at that time I thought it's Okay, it's okay, there's a guard and everything like that. And uh, so I took the hotel which was voted the best one for safety. I took in Lagos, for example. So I'm always wondering if hotel, a hotelier can, uh, can secure that uh, it is safe in his hotel in a country which is not stable. This is something I'm always thinking about. It's not only terrorist attacks, it's uh, everything. If you go to a country where there are uh, tsunamis, maybe, if there's a danger, can you do anything as a hotel chain? Uh, um, hmm. First, I'd just like to build a bit on what Georges Pierre, and I will answer your question, hmm. but first, just to build on what Georges Pierre and Gerard said. Travel hmm. is actually probably getting a lot more safe 
uh, we, we hear more about incidents today. Mm. But remember back in the old days, we never told anybody there was incidents and there wasn't Twitter and, and social media for people to share about it themselves. And so we didn't hear that much about it. But I mean, if you look back at the 70s, there was hijackings, there was more plane crashes, there was all kinds of risks yeah. around travel. So I think on the one side, maybe we're personally becoming a little bit more risk averse. On the other side, it is getting a lot safer. We, now to your question, we, we uh, have a bit of a reputation for operating hotels in challenging markets. Um, and it, although there's a lot a hotel can do, we can't change the external environment, right? So, um, but we can do what we can internally. And this is where the link into Sebastian comes as well, that as a hotel or any part of the tourism industry, you, you have to play your part, but you also have to play a part in your community to make that safe, train your staff. The, a good example I could share there is, is from Sierra Leone, where we opened our hotel in Freetown three weeks before Ebola was declared an emergency in the country. And that was in April. And by September, um, we were in a situation where we could either pull the plug, cut, and, and, and run, uh, because there was basically no guests. Uh, the hotel was hemorrhaging funds for the owner and for us. Um, so the, the general manager was actually given two choices. We shut down and leave, or we fire half the staff. And I had a chat with him and he said, I don't, he, I don't want to do either of these two. We're in a poor country. Can I really fire half the staff and say, you know, go out and, and try to make a, your way in life in a country that's suffering from this horrible disease? And so he, the, the end result was they kept all the staff and everyone took a pay cut. Um, and then they were going to try to make it through to the end of the year. There were a few NGOs coming in to help out with the Ebola and stuff, and they were training our staff. So there was a huge cooperation between the experts that were coming in to help the country and the hotel to keep the hotel as a safe place for them in this uncertain environment around them. Um, and then by November, the world kind of woke up and everybody was going to uh, Sierra Leone to help out. So you had NGOs and experts coming in from all over the place. The good thing was we kept all the staff on there so they could all come to a place where everyone was trained, everyone was clean, there was no issue. Had we fired half the staff, we, had a, we would have had to go out into an uncertain environment and try to hire back people. So yes, we can do a lot to keep our hotels safe in uncertain environments, but doing that is almost always a collaboration between the hotel and the community. So the key is networking between all the stakeholders Absolutely. who are doing tourism. That's Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, last topic, uh, Georges-Pierre, the hospitality industry should do better in networking with everybody to secure to safety and security. They should do better in a better way. And it was quite inter interesting to hear you say that in your opinion uh, that uh, new technologies could help with that. So on this way to safety and security for the guests. So uh, what do you mean with that? Safety apps on the handy or it's called handy in Germany. It's a mobile phone for the others. Or what do you mean with that? Well, there is a lot of uh, technological um, innovation that will take place, which will go into that direction. I think, you know, the hospitality industry, specifically talking about what Paul said earlier around standards, has a long way to go to make sure that the end user, the business traveler, in my case, but the tourist as well, have a, a true understanding of um, not only that this particular hotel chain or this particular hotel is safe per se, but which type of safety standard they are there to. And, and to your point, when you're booking an hotel today through whatever channels you want to go, 
there is not really a way for you to consider safety and security as a measure per se. You know, as, um, as we were discussing earlier, there might be a country which is, you know, a country which is quite uh, either unsafe or uh, in trouble, but that doesn't mean that every part of that country is in trouble. Which part of uh, a particular city is more safe than others, which you know, hotel in that particular city will therefore be safer than others. I think you know, there is something that can be done uh, technologically from this perspective, and that, that's what I think, f from my perspective, what I see from our customers telling us and business travelers, that's where the need is which is, as long as you can you know, provide me information, again, I, I come back to that, because it's part of preemption. As long as you, you have the information, you can make a choice. If you don't have the information, you know, the choice you're making is basically taking a decision without knowing where you're going, which is, I think, you know, the worst you can do as far as taking care of your personal safety. So all of the innovation um, that we are working on and the partners that we are uh, uh, working with are, are going into that direction, providing this information, whether through a mobile application, which is the obvious choice today, uh, or, or the means to, to our business travelers. Yeah. Thank you. So, last topic again technology and uh, warning systems and everything like that. Uh, Sebastian, last question, even. So, uh, you have, maybe you have got some questions as well. Last question. What do you think? What is better? that the people, that the tourists see that there are protection systems, that they can see them, or there should be a taboo. Is it good in Germany? There's a big discussion for every, every camera. So if it is in the, in the, I don't know, in the subway, so we discuss it about one year, and then it is removed, you know, or it isn't moved there. So what do you really think? Is, is it better for the tourists to feel secure and see the camera? and feel like, I don't know, Gläser am Mensch, I don't know the in English, but uh, uh, if they are big brothers watching you, or is it better to do it some another way that they don't see it and it won't be that effective? What is your opinion and the opinion of Paris? The, that's a central issue, uh, because we're talking about psychology. Um, I totally agree with what was said before. Uh, traveling is safer now even in Paris or wherever in the world, than it was uh, 10 years or 20 years ago. But the emotion uh, after a terrorist attack is so huge um, that it's not rational. Um, and so we have to develop measures, to, in Paris at least, to make visible the security. Uh, and that's also because of this psychological issue that together the state, the region and the city uh, spent 8 million euros in communication campaign to support the tourist industry, saying it's safe to come back, you can come back. Um, actually, statistically speaking, or talking about probability, it's much more dangerous today to drive a car in Paris metropolitan area or to breathe air than to die in a terrorist attack. 6,500 deaths per year just because of air pollution. So we're talking about acceptable risk and others that are not. Uh, and, but the number of deaths has so nothing to do that we're really thinking about this psychological effect. Uh, after the terrorist attack in Paris, no debates anymore about uh, cameras. Before, many debates. After that, everybody agreed, or it was so touchy that nobody wanted to say, uh, no, we don't want the camera anymore. But um, there is also the visible um, soldiers, like in many cities. For instance, in Paris, we have soldiers with huge guns uh, everywhere, in the airport, train station, in the streets, everywhere. People ask for that, so we have to give that, of course. Uh, because it reassures uh, people to see uh, guns and soldiers uh, protecting them. But in the same time, uh, ISIS designated soldiers as targets, specific targets. A couple of weeks ago, in the Louvre Museum in Paris, soldiers were the targets. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a dilemma. For instance, myself, when I see soldiers in the street, I try not to walk close to them, because they are targets. <laughs> And so it's reassuring in a way, but in a second way, it's maybe creating another risk. So it's a dilemma, it looks like a dilemma, and I don't have the answer yet. 
Well, <laughs> okay, so, uh, but maybe we have to find a way out of this dilemma because it's also, we should try to. But the main thing is, because the discussion is uh, coming to an end, uh, not discussion, this panel is coming to an end, the uh, main thing is that without networking, first of all, there's no possibility to assure um, safety and security in tourism. And if we don't do more and if we don't do better, that's what I feel, then we'll have a problem with tour tourism. It's going not down, but it will be reduced. And as I told you before, 5%, that's a catastrophe. So uh, economical. See, not only the people, but uh, economical. So this is the first thing. All the stakeholders to, uh, should work together, and they shouldn't work together only in one country, for example, in uh, Turkey or in Kazakhstan or in Germany. They should work between the cities, between the stakeholders, between the countries. It should be everywhere, but it is maybe a huge uh, thing to realize that because uh, it will take Years, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. So, if there are any questions, maybe we could answer them in the last one and a quarter minutes. No? No. <laughs> She's the chef, I told you before. So, <laughs> okay. So, but there's one thing you have to do again. You have to vote again. Sorry to say that. So, first of all, thank you to the four of you. It was, for me, it was very interesting, and we talked about these topics before. It was really interesting. It's, on the one hand side, uh, the industry is far beyond the point where I thought it would be. On the other hand side, there are lots of things to be done. In German, it's called, as uh, well said it, es gibt viel zu tun, packen wir es an. So this is um, last thing, last thing from my side. So. Please vote again, the same question and the same answers, and maybe the 43% can be topped. <laughs> so thank you for being <laughs> here. Better, no? <laughs> and thank you for going only after voting. No. <laughs>